everyone. <laughs> yeah, uh, so thank you for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I love, love, love hackathons. I think there's you know, a huge amount of energy, huge amount of creativity, young people trying to do cool things, learning together, creating. I don't, it's just like my favorite place to be, and I've had my fair share of hackathons. So really a uh, great pleasure to be here and talk to you today. Um, so one thing is, this is bigger than I expected when they invited me. <laughs> so this is really large here. Um, I kind of feel like actually the scale of uh, the hackathon is quite large. And I guess like one thing I wanted to start with is that just in case you're wondering, uh, this is not normal for AI. I've been in AI for about 15 years, so I can say that with confidence. And uh, you know, it's kind of just like grown a lot. So for me, AI is you know a couple hundred uh, academics getting together in like a workshop of a conference and you know talking together about some esoteric details of some math. And uh, so this is what I'm used to. Uh, this is when I entered AI about 15 years ago. You're working with, say, when you're training um, neural networks, you're working with these tiny digits from MNIST. You're training a restricted Boltzmann machine. You're using contrastive divergence to train your network. And then you're scrutinizing these on your first layer to make sure that the network trained correctly. And I know none of that makes any sense uh, because it's been so long ago. Uh, but it was a different vibe back then, and it was not as crazy. I think things have really gotten out of proportion to some extent, but it is really beautiful to see the energy. And today, 15 years later, it looks a lot more like this. Uh, <laughs> so this is, I guess, where AI is today. Uh, and that's also why this event is so large, I expect. Um, so yeah, NVIDIA, the manufacturer of GPUs, which is used for all the heavy lifting for our neural networks, is now the most valuable company in the United States and has taken over. And uh, this is the day that we live in today and why we have so many hackathons like this and so on, which I think is quite amazing, but definitely unprecedented. And this is a very unique point in time that you're, many, many of you maybe are entering the AI field right now. And this is not normal. It's super interesting, super unique. There's a ton happening. Now, I think fundamentally the reason behind that is that I think the nature of computation basically is changing. And uh, we kind of have like a new computing paradigm that we're entering into. And this is very rare. I kind of almost feel, almost feel like it's the 1980s of computing all over again. And instead of having a central processing unit that uh, you know, works on instructions over bytes, we have these large language models, which are kind of like the central processing unit uh, uh, working on tokens, which are little string pieces instead. And uh, then in addition to that, we have a context window of tokens instead of a RAM of bytes. And we have equivalents of disk and everything else. So it's a bit like a computer. And uh, this is the orchestrator. And that's why I call this like the large language model LMOS. And uh, I sort of like tweeted about this in the, some more detail before. And so I see this as a new computer that we're all learning how to program and uh, what it's good at, what it's not as good at, how to incorporate it into products, and really how to squeeze the most out of it. So that, I think, is quite exciting. And I think maybe many of you have seen the GPT-4.0 demo that came out from OpenAI two, three weeks ago or something like that. And you're really starting to get a sense that this is, uh, this is a thing that you can actually talk to. And uh, it responds back in your nature, um, natural interface of like audio. And it sees and hears and can paint and can do all these things. Uh, I think potentially many of you have seen this movie. If you haven't, I would definitely watch it. It's extremely inspirational for us today, uh, movie Her. And actually, kind of, kind of presently in this movie, um, when uh, this main character here talks to the AI, that AI is called an OS, an operating system. So I think that's very present from that movie. Uh, and it's a beautiful movie, and I encourage you to watch it. Now, the thing is that in this movie, I think the focus is very much on like the emotional intelligence kind of aspects of these models. But these models, in practice, in our society, will probably be doing a ton of problem solving in the digital space. And so it's not just going to be a single digital entity that kind of in some weird way resembles a human almost, in that you can talk to it, but it's not quite a human, of course. But it's not just a single digital entity. Maybe there's many of these digital entities. And uh, maybe we can give them tasks, and they can talk to each other and collaborate, and they have fake Slack threads. And they're just doing a ton of work in the digital space. And uh, they're automating a ton of digital infrastructure. Not just a digital infrastructure, uh, but maybe physical infrastructure as well. And uh, this is kind of an earlier stages, I would say, and will probably happen uh, slightly lagging behind a lot of the digital innovations, because it's so much easier to work with bits than atoms. Uh, but this is another movie that I would definitely point you to. It's one of my favorites. It is not well, well, very well known at all. It's called iRobot, and it's from 2004. Will Smith, amazing movie. And it kind of explores this future with like humanoid robots doing a lot of tasks in society. 
And kind of spoiler alert, it doesn't go so well <laughs> for these people in this movie, and the robots kind of like take over a little bit. Uh, but um, I think it's kind of interesting to think through, and I definitely would encourage you to also watch this movie. And this movie takes place in 2035, allegedly, which is 10 years away. And so maybe in 10 years, you can definitely squint and think about that maybe we are going to be in a place where uh, these things are walking around and talking to us and performing tasks in physical world and digital world. And what does that look like? What does that mean? And how do we program them? How do we make sure uh, you know, they, um, that they sort of do what we want them to, et cetera? So when you put all this together, I think the feeling that people talk about often is this feeling of AGI, like do you feel the AGI, quote unquote. And what this means is that you really intuitively understand the magnitude of what could be coming uh, around the corner if this stuff actually continues to work. Um, the amount of automation that we can potentially have in both the digital space and the, the physical space. Now, I don't know about you, but I actually find this picture kind of bleak. Uh, this is what came out when I put a bunch of the uh, last few minutes of talk into an image generator. And I don't actually like this uh, picture. I think we can do better. And you know, you have, we have a few thousand people here. You're about to enter the industry, and you're going to be working on a lot of this technology, and you're going to be shaping it, and you'll have some active sort of power over it. So I don't know, maybe we want this to look something like this. I mean, this is what I would like. Um, so this is humans, animals, and nature coexisting in harmony. And, but secretly, this is actually a high-tech society. And there are robots and quadcopters, and there's a ton of automation. But it's hidden away, and it's, uh, it's not sort of like in your face. And uh, so maybe this is something that we want instead. And you should feel a lot of agency over what you want the future to be like, uh, because you're going to build it. Uh, so maybe we can agree right now that this is better than the previous picture. But I don't know about you, but I would hope so, because I'm going to be living in that future, I think. So the question for this hackathon, I mean, a lot of you have worked on a, really cool, a bunch of really cool projects over the last day or two. And the question is, how do we go from hacking to actually changing the world and building this future, um, whatever that may be for you? And so what I thought I would do in this talk is go over maybe like my last 15 years or so in the industry. And I think I had a bit of a window into how projects become real world change. And I have some takeaways and things like that and that I maybe wanted to talk about. So the first thing that I find really incredible is how projects that are sometimes very small projects, like little snowballs, can actually like snowball into really big projects and just how incredible that is to watch. So as an example, I have my fair share of hackathons, like I mentioned. These are some projects from a long time ago that I worked on over the last 15 years or so. So I had a little Rubik's Cube color extractor. I put up some game programming tutorials on YouTube like 13 years ago and tried to teach people programming for games. Uh, I had a video games and a lot of them. I had this like kind of janky neuroevolution simulator, <laughs> which uh, was kind of interesting. And uh, unsurprisingly, not all of these projects actually go on to snowball. A lot of this is just exploration. You're tinkering. And so actually, these three projects didn't really go anywhere for me. I wouldn't say that it was really wasted work. It was just like it didn't add up to and didn't snowball, but it was still like helping me along the way. I'll come back to that later. Uh, but the game programming tutorials actually ended up snowballing for me in a certain way, because that led me from game programming tutorials to a bunch of Rubik's Cube videos, actually, that became kind of popular at the time. And this kind of sparked an interest in teaching for me. And then when I was a PhD student at Stanford, I uh, got to teach this class CS231N um, and got to develop it and teach it. And this was the first like, big deep learning class at Stanford. And uh, a lot of people have gone on to like this. And then after that, I ended up making another YouTube channel, which is um, my Zero to Hero series for deep learning and LLMs. So a lot of people like that as well. And then on top of that, continuing to snowball, the project that I'm currently very interested in is this next class and what it could look like and how I can make it better. And I'm calling that LLM 101N. And it's about building a storyteller, something like kind of a chat GPT that you can work with to generate stories. And the idea is you build everything from scratch, uh, from basic prerequisites, all the way to like kind of a chat GPT clone in the domain of storytelling. And building that from scratch, I think, will be really instructive, could be really fun. I only published this on GitHub like two or three days ago, so it's pretty raw and still very much in the early stages. But I'm really excited for it. And this, for me, is an example of a snowball. It started with like 13 years ago, a little game programming. And I'm working on a course that I think will be really interesting. Um, thank you. Another example from my life, I think, is the snowball that I've witnessed with OpenAI. So as was briefly mentioned, I was a founding member, researcher of OpenAI. And so I was there seven years ago. These are some images that are public of what it was like um, uh, working out of Greg's apartment, like eight of us. 
And uh, OpenAI was founded to be kind of like a counterbalance to Google. <laughs> and Google had, was like this gorilla with 70 billion free cash flow. And back then, Google employed like half of the AI research industry almost. Uh, so it was kind of like a, uh, you know, um, an interesting setup, I would say. And we were just like eight people with a laptop. So that was really interesting. And very similar to my background, OpenAI ended up exploring a large number of projects internally. We hired some really good people. And many of them like, didn't go uh, too far, but some of them really did work. And so as an example, here's a project that uh, was in an early stage, a very small snowball at, in the early history of OpenAI. Someone worked on a Reddit chatbot. And if you come by their desk and you're like, I mean, what does this look like when someone's working on a Reddit chatbot? We're trying to like, compete with Google. <laughs> And you're working on a Reddit chatbot, like we should be doing something bigger. Uh, and so it's very easy to dismiss these small snowballs because they're so fragile, right? These projects are so fragile in the beginning. But actually, this Reddit chatbot, and by the way, don't read too much into the specific details. These are kind of like random screenshots, <laughs> just for illustration. Uh, but this was a Reddit chatbot, and it looked naive. But actually, Reddit chatbot, what is that? It's a language model, and it happens to be trained on Reddit, but actually, you could train a, le a language model on any arbitrary data, not just Reddit. And when the transformer came out, this was spun into something that worked much better. And then the domain was expanded from just Reddit to many other web pages. And suddenly you get GPT-1, GPT-2, 3, 4, and then you get GPT-4.0. So actually, this Reddit chatbot that was so easy to dismiss uh, actually like, ended up leading uh, and snowballing into GPT-4.0, which we currently think of as this like, change in the computing paradigm. <laughs> and you can talk to it, and it's amazing. So it's really incredible for me to have witnessed some of those, um, I guess, snowballs. And today, OpenAI, of course, is worth uh, maybe somewhere just below $100 billion or something like that. So uh, really incredible, uh, incredible to see some of these snowballs in practice. So I would say a lot of you over the last two days have also worked on small projects, small snowballs maybe. And it's really incredible to me that some, some of them probably won't go anywhere, but probably some of them actually will. And uh, you should continue the momentum of your projects, and maybe they can add up to a really big uh, snowball. And that's really incredible to watch. The next thing I wanted to briefly talk about is this concept of 10,000 hours that was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, I think. I actually am quite a big believer in it, and I think that to a very large extent, success comes from just repeated practice and just a huge amount of it, and you should be very willing to put in those 10,000 hours and just literally just count. Don't be too nervous about what am I working about, am I succeeding or failing, etc. Just do simple bean counting of how many hours you're, gonna, you're doing, and everything adds up. Even the projects that I failed at and didn't snowball into anything, those add to my counter of the number of hours I've spent developing my expertise and getting into an empowered state of being able to take on these projects with confidence and getting them to work. So a few examples of that. Um, I made this like, really janky website a few uh, weeks ago. This was a weekend project, and it's called awesomemovies.life. <laughs> and uh, you, you can visit it. I think it still works. I'm not 100% sure. I wouldn't recommend you go there. It's trying to be a movie recommendation engine, because I was trying to figure out what to watch on that Saturday. And then I was like, OK, I need to build myself a movie recommendation engine. So I put this up. And one of the tweets that was a reply to mine was, wow, that's so cool that you got this to work in the weekend. And I was kind of reflecting on that at the time because it wasn't as amazing to me. And the reason for that was that what this person is not seeing is that this is my 20th time like, making a website like this. Uh, like, and so I see all the steps I was going to follow. OK, I need a Linode. I need a Flask server. I'm going to write some, some of this uh, JavaScript, style sheets, HTML. I'm going to spin this up together. I need, all, I need to scrape all these web pages. I need to extract the TF-IDF uh, vectors. I need to train SVM. And all of these things are things I've already done before 20 times. I already have code snippets lying around from previous projects. And I'm just remixing what I have. And I've already done all of this. And so remixing everything into a new form isn't actually that much work and allowed me to put this up over the weekend. And it's not that crazy. And this only comes from expertise. This only comes from having done it 20 times that you can do this so confidently. The next example I would say in my life was a Tesla Autopilot. So, um, I was hired to lead the computer vision team at Tesla Autopilot about seven or eight years ago. And uh, one of the first things I did, actually, when I joined the team was I basically ended up rewriting the computer vision uh, deep learning network uh, training code base uh, from scratch in PyTorch in some of the first few months that I entered uh, the team. And I sort of like, rewrote the whole thing from scratch. <laughs> and that ended up being a kernel of what it is now. And I think to some extent, to some people, that looked impressive at the time. But for me, it wasn't because I was coming from my PhD, and I spent five years 
doing stuff like that. And I knew exactly what needs to go into there. I need my training set, my evaluation sets. I need my training loop in PyTorch. I need my um, uh, sort of configs. I need my log directories. I need to bring in a ResNet. I need to put in detection. We're doing a regression classification. And so the whole thing, like I'm anticipating all the steps, and that only comes from experience. That only comes from having done it 20 times before. And so I think this makes a huge difference. And things that look impressive are maybe much less impressive to you if you've done it 20 times before. So really try to get to this point where you have your 10,000 hours. It makes a huge difference. And uh, just, uh, yeah, that's it. By the way, 10,000 hours, if you're doing six hours per day, I think this works out to about five years. Uh, so it's about a length of a PhD that you need to develop expertise in an area. Uh, so I think it's roughly correct that that works out to about a PhD length. The other thing that I found is actually quite useful is uh, to keep the dopamine flowing. Be aware of your psychology, your brain, how it works, and what it needs to keep going and how to keep inspired. And so in particular, your brain is a reward machine, and it wants rewards, and you need to give it rewards. So what is a good way to give it rewards? And in my practice, it is by doing projects. And work on projects and continue publishing them. And so here I have a web page snippet of some of the projects I have worked on in the past. And these are hackathon projects and random projects, and not all of them are good. Some of them are not quite good, et cetera. But what I love about projects is a number of things. Number one, I love that projects get you to work on something end-to-end -end and depth-wise. Like, normally when you go to classes, you're learning in a breadth-wise fashion. You're learning a lot of stuff just in case you might need it in the future. Well, when you're working on a project, you know what you need, and you're learning it on demand, and you're just trying to get it to work. So I think it's a very different mode of learning that really complements the breadth-wise learning and is very important. So I 100% encourage people to work on projects. The other thing is putting them up is actually also like a really good Jedi mind trick in my experience. The reason for that is that if you're going to put something up, you're thinking about all the people who are going to be looking at it, your friends and teammates and family and fr future employers, etc. And so that really increases the bar for your own work. And it, it makes you work harder because they're going to be looking at it and you feel shame if it was crappy. And so you work much harder and you're going to go that extra mile to make it really good. And that really, uh, really helps. Um, and lastly, when other people are looking at your projects, uh, you're going to get that reward because they like it, they appreciate it, they fork it, they work on top of it. And so that feels good to your brain. And so the way that this comes together is you are getting your dopamine, you feel good. That way you can build up to 10,000 hours of experience, and that's what helps you a lot. Snowball your projects from a small snowball all the way to a really big one and actually make change in the world. So in summary, that's, I think, how it works like on a high level. And the message is just keep hacking. <laughs> That's it. Uh, <laughs> and then hopefully, uh, this is the future that we're going to build together when we snowball all of our stuff or something like that, uh, but not the, not the first picture I showed, hopefully. And that's it. Thank you.